right, wasn't the going. Super Bowl yesterday? <laughs> yeah. We are going live. <laughs> oh, pay attention. Let us know as usual <laughs> if the audio works. I'm just assuming it does. Okay. Um, I got the notification. Your stream is still we've just paused this preview to see your resources. Can you see my Photoshop? Yeah, let me open it up. Cause uh you made a suggestion uh last time that I should Oh on the Discord? On yeah, yeah, yeah. So we just gotta click the um screen share link. Um no I cannot see it. This is So you did it the wrong way. This is paused. Um, and no, just... I can see you did it through a different uh, method. You did uh, go live. Uh, you need to click the screen share link icon, the like text channel, and then there's a click here. Do you see that? What? It's uh, the one the one that's in admin. Um, the screen share link? Yeah, the one right above us. And then what do I do? And then bottom left, there's like a turn on screen share. Bottom left. Like I just turned mine on. You can see. You cannot see. It's all good. Let's sort this out some other time. <laughs> You're just going to have to watch. Uh, I guess I have to enable it through the bot, but I'll do that later. I thought it was as simple as just clicking and going. It should be. We use it all the time. Yeah. No, I believe you. I think I don't have it set up. Like I have to set it up. This is enable. All right, well, do do the go share. live thing. Do what you did last time. Oh, here we'll, you go. We can probably join that way. No, I think I get it. Hold on, and then turn on screen share. There you go. Oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> Snaps. You can see that real, all right? Yeah. Okay. All right, um, cool. And then I'm going to go ahead and switch it over for the people down <laughs> there, so they can see. <clears throat> yep. Oh, I had my camera lens on. Oh, shoot. All right, there you go. Now we're all officially started. It looks like people in the chat can see and hear me. Daddy Jones, that's right. I'm here. <laughs> can you guys see this painting too? Yep. All right. And then... Um, we got, I think everyone can hear you guys fine. I think we're good. Yeah, I, I heard it a second ago. Oh, okay. All right, cool. So then let's, yeah, were... let's get, let's get this party started. What's up everybody. Welcome to this week's stream. Hope you guys had a great weekend. Hope you guys had a good, uh, Super Bowl weekend. Uh, I don't, I don't know if any of you guys here celebrate the Super Bowl, the American holiday. Did you guys, Mike, Rioma? No? No. No. <laughs> I just I'm my mom and dad did. Show. You just watched the halftime show? Not on Twitter. Yeah, and also the commercials. <laughs> <laughs> you remember the, there was a time where, um, I don't know if you remember this, where MTV had Celebrity Deathmatch. You guys remember this? Or mm -hmm. heard of it? Yeah. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Rioma, you know? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. This, this this guy is gonna be super talkative. I can feel it. <laughs> no, yes. Is it with the claymations Maybe. and stuff like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, it, it's super... he's got that Japanese sternness. <laughs> it's super awesome, man. I I loved it. Um, yeah, one of the the things uh, that it was trying to do was trying to like because I guess a lot of a lot of halftime shows in the past were kind of just boring. And so they were like, well, what if we just like make a crazy halftime show like where we just have celebrities fight each other to, to the death, you know, with one person standing. And so you like after the when the halftime show would show up, you would have to go to MTV to see it, you know, and uh, it was it was hilarious. And uh, I'm not sure exactly why they stopped doing it, but they stopped doing it, obviously. But uh, this halftime show was freaking good, though. I liked it. Uh, me and my wife were both watching it. And we're just like, dang, dude, what the? And it was funny because my first reaction, too, was like, 
was like, dude, how old is Shakira? Because I could have, I could have sworn she's like getting like older. You know, she's getting into well, both her, of them are pretty old. Into yeah. her forties, isn't she well, like fifty? Like, well, I thought like I already knew uh, Jennifer Lopez was older, mm-hmm. right? But, um, but and she looks great, even though she's like much older. You know, Shakira is forty three. Yeah, and then that's when I googled it. I was like, "Whoa, dude!" It's like she's got some of that anti aging juice going on, or something. She like never ages, you know. And my wife was like, "Yeah, man, that's Latinas you never age." And I was like, "Yeah, I guess not." <laughs> but it, it was it was cool. It was a good show. It was like it was super spicy. It's a lot of flavor. I liked it. <clears throat> But anyway, and it's funny, like, uh, I, I go on TikTok a lot, and you can tell the pulse of the internet usually with TikTok, and everyone was like, yeah. commenting on it. Totally. So, anyway, um, I'm glad that you may have not enjoyed the Super Bowl other than the halftime and the commercials. That is fine. <laughs> the game was a good game, though. It was really uh, intense until, like, the last few minutes where it was just, like, the Niners just kept on literally dropping the ball you know and so i was just like oh man i'm not like crazy into sports but i do like to watch them whenever they're on especially the big ones you know uh this is true for like the olympics too you know when you see like a really just like people who are really good at what they do you know it's always enjoyable to watch yeah um but anyway anyway uh, i had a good weekend it was pretty simple uh nothing too crazy um, but I will say before we get into this that I launched my Patreon officially and I've also revamped the website to have the club be more accessible uh, to those who are already club members. And so uh, I've made these changes. You can visit them, visit me on the Patreon through Robot Pencil is my, my gamer tag, I guess. And so then I've done that and you can also just go to my website, robotpencil.net and find everything you'll need. To find like from tutorials to mentorships and such. I think my April is already getting sold out too. Um, my mentorships are selling out pretty good. So I think the Patreon and such are going to be helpful to those who are just kind of chilling. And someone actually mentioned in the Patreon was like, it'd be cool to have like a spectator seat in some of the mentorship classes. Right? I was like, that's actually not a bad idea. But I'll have to think about it. I have to really consider how that would work but it's gone live and it's been about a week right and it's already really really successful i think a lot of people really enjoy it. i already enjoy the system better even with the club i'm doing it blog style and it's just so much more effective just so much more effective you know um and easier for me to maintain so i can focus on content creating content which has been great and uh a lot of people have responded well to it i'm really happy for that you know, uh, I think we're almost at a hundred too. So if you can get us to a hundred, that'd be great. Uh, I'll do something special once we get to a hundred. It's a good number. And, uh, I think all 24 continue. hour painting live stream, <laughs> uh, 24 hours. No, straight. I don't know about that. Painting. 100% <laughs> guaranteed 24 hour <laughs> painting live stream. Yeah. I'll be dead. Uh, but <laughs> I was planning on doing something along those lines, like a l- longer format stream you know and maybe do it every 12 hundred. hour right. live stream so let's go ahead and move on <laughs> <laughs> this guy yeah, let's get past this <laughs> um if you could share uh, the link to this that'd be great and then uh links in the description okay you can share in the chat yeah. too just in case people are like wait what what's the description to which one the patreon uh you can just send it to the website and then through the website you guys can find all, all right. the stuff um all right and then um uh, and then I will say that we're also going to do a Seattle event. We're looking into April, right? This is when we're trying to do it. Yes. Uh, and I sent out a mailing list uh, on my Facebook. If you can grab that link and then just relink it in this in, oh, the, yeah. in YouTube, that'd be great. And for those of you who are wondering what I'm doing, I'm actually trying to create my own patterns right now. And so I can create some cooler brushes. But with that being said, I'll let Ryoma talk about himself since we got a guest here. Introduce yourself, Hello. my friend. What's going on? Uh, I'm Ryan Matazzi. Uh, I've been in the entertainment industry for almost a decade. Dang, dude. Doing like all sorts of stuff of like 
concepting, visual development, art direction, and even animation. So yeah, and I'm just continuing to learn and just develop through through art. Right on, man. Yeah, and so for any of you guys who are curious about his work, his stuff has been linked into, into the chat. So feel free to take a look at it there. Uh, also, um, if you have questions about his art or what it was like to work on some of the projects that he worked on, feel free to ask. So I, I actually kind of want to know, like, what, what projects have you worked on recently or in the past that you think are pretty dope or um, you think would be, you know, something worth talking about? Sure. I mean, usually for me, like, as time gone on, like, the people that I'm working with, it became more important. But of course, like projects that I was really excited about, especially when I was like earlier on, uh, I did stuff for League of Legends. Uh, I did some stuff for like the Star Wars IP, but, and uh, I did uh, art direction for like new IPs and stuff. Uh, like there was one called Bot Smashers. Fortunately, it got canceled. For, that's like kind of like the common story for a lot of like projects. Wait, fortunately but, or, yeah. or unfortunately? Unfortunately, okay. yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> but, yeah. Screw that project. Yeah, yeah I but I hated that project, bro. <laughs> I was like, what? What? But yeah, like it's just uh, I don't know. It's uh, there's a lot of cool experiences and a lot of different places and a lot of different projects. But uh, yeah, those are kind of like a couple of examples. Okay. Well, what's the difference between or at least for you in terms of like working on concepts like we did maybe for League of Legends versus art direction like you did for the fortunately canceled project you worked on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot that go, goes into it. So, But from your from perspective. Like, yeah, yeah. Like uh, well, League of Legends is like you're just pretty much coming up with design for one asset, right? Mm -hmm. Where um, when I was doing stuff for Bot Smashers, you're thinking about the team dynamic the team chemistry, setting that up, making sure that it's healthy. Uh, there's able, you know, for growth as well as, you know, good direction for them to, to follow and execute. Also the business practices, like talking to outsourcing from like China, uh, talking to the CEO, talking to the marketing department. Um, and typically, you know, of course, like you, you want to just focus on the visual aspect of it, but there's all these other aspects that kind of, influence that so you have to understand you know what's going on on those other areas to make sure that everything is working with each other cohesively so yeah it's uh it's more than just creating just the visual style of a world but it's also how what are you creating as a visual style how is it going to resonate with the audience how is it going to resonate with the other departments uh within the studio and uh hopefully trying to make everything work all together okay that's cool man so when you were bringing in artists, how, how did you go about finding new artists? Something that so, I think a lot of artists in here are probably curious about. A lot of people who are students sure. or not professionals, right? They always ask this question of how do I get in there, you know? And um, yeah. before you answer, I usually try to remind them that it's really about putting your stuff in front of people and having the kind of quality work that you need to have for that specific studio, right? So you mentioned Riot. Uh, if you're working, if you want to work for Riot, right? Like you would have to have some sort of aesthetic or understanding of what they need to do and want to do and then prove it within your portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. But from the position of somebody who hires uh, or brought on artists or worked with artists, like what was your favorite thing to see from people that you were brought onto the team or brought onto the team or people that were already on the team and yeah, what would be like um, one of your least favorite things that you experienced and things oh, that were hard for you to, <laughs> to deal with? You don't have sure, to tell anybody. You don't have to rat out people like, no, oh, no, dude, I'm not Steven gonna... from friggin'. <laughs> I hated that guy, dude. He would always show yeah, up and just throw donuts at my face. Like, don't throw donuts at people's faces. I'm like, what? It's really bizarre. <laughs> he was like, it happens way more often than you think. But anyway, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. <laughs> um... Well, I mean, so we were in an interesting position where we were kind of like an R&D department for the company to create uh -huh. a new IP. And we're trying to establish uh, a new direction for the company. So um, in this case, I was looking for artists that were able to develop uh, more than just character designs. They can do character designs. They have a little bit of a variety and range in their work. They can do environments. 
And they also can do a lot, a lot of a variation in style because we would be investigating, you know, these different directions to see if it resonates with the project. Mm. So um, in this particular case, which is not going to be the case for like, for example, like Riot, Riot, they're probably going to be looking for something specific. Like, can you do something stylized that has a little bit of a twist with anime, right? That's sure. probably what they're looking for. Where in our case, I was looking for that range, to, that versatility. So um yeah i mean it was cool to see people uh putting up a portfolio of throughout the whole process you know from sketches to the final design i think a lot of times we see an art station like the final finished product Absolutely. which is beautiful it's really nice to see um but it doesn't give me uh the angle of like how do you come up with a design in the first place what are you thinking why are you making your design choices and uh seeing that from you know people that I chose from like that was the thing that kind of sold me and also reached out to them to see if they were available so um yeah uh, in that case it was oh it's to, to answer your other questions like what were the things that I didn't like seeing mm -hmm. um, there was let's see I definitely saw some portfolios where it was very specific to like the the artist didn't have a voice they were trying to chase a style that obviously they weren't comfortable with mm -hmm. and it's kind of like you know I, I art is a performance and you can kind of tell when someone is not in it through their work because it's like the traces of their performance uh, when they put mm -hmm. it on the canvas and you see on their canvas that they're kind of uncomfortable through their line work or their brush stroke or anything, everything like that. So there was a, a lot of actually students that I saw when they were submitting a portfolio that they looked like they were stressed <laughs> or uncomfortable through their work. And to me, it was just like, why, you know, like if, if this is something that you're not even passionate or even happy doing, you mm -hmm. know, or even comfortable or confident in doing, uh, I wouldn't even have that in your portfolio because what would be an example of this? Like, what would it look like? Um, an example of this would be, I think assignments for classes is a good one. Uh, just no, because man. it's like, it's like something that you see that <laughs> it's, it's, they're learning, right? It's yeah. the, they're, they're learning mm -hmm. something for the first time, or maybe something that is not there. They don't have a lot of experience in. And yeah. you, you look at their work and it's just like, it's screaming, like, <laughs> that struggle yeah no i am learning yeah the reason why i was like <laughs> my man was because um i always tell people like when you're putting student work into a portfolio um that's exactly the reaction people will like people can tell you know yep. like they can tell that you're just trying to pass the class mm -hmm. versus like trying to build a good portfolio yeah. you know what i mean so i'm i'm happy that you agree with the sentiment uh well i mean it, it, i mean just to kind of like uh, add to what you're saying it's like you know we you you know you and i have like we've been developing you know a way to express these different moods and like understanding of like all these different like just all these a culmination of all these ideas and presented as a, a digestible form of entertainment or like in a visual format and a lot of the person can be seen through that so I think for a lot of students, they don't understand that when you're struggling, when you're not comfortable and you're not confident, that's all of that is just going to go through your work. And it's like singing, right? You can tell when someone's singing in their voice, they're nervous if they don't, <laughs> if they're not comfortable with the song. And that, I think that's, there's the same kind of parallel to someone's work in the visuals in the 2d space. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, um, I um, have this story where I talk about how um, I was working. I'm going to restart my Photoshop for a second. Um, <clears throat> I have the story about how when I first started building my portfolio, I essentially had this problem where uh, I just kind of did homework assignments and I would show it to people at like you know big companies and such and they would have you know they, they wouldn't be inspired by it they would just be like eh, whatever you know they're just kind of like that's cool work 
but who cares? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, what I realized was that when I went to his mixer and somebody looked at my portfolio and they were like, oh, you know, there's a lot of really good drawings here and good studies. But there's nothing in here that's like, um, there's nothing in here that's like inspiring or interesting or new, right? Everything just kind of feels like, yeah, you just, just copying paste what I saw online or just like regurgitations of assignments, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and he said like, you know, you got to remember your artwork has to inspire other artists and other people that aren't artists, like the actual consumers. Like when someone looks at this artwork, like this concept design, like they're going to want to be like, dude, I want to play that video game or watch that movie or see what that TV show is about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, right now you just got like a mountain. Like that looks like just a nicely painted mountain, you know, <laughs> like cool. But like, what, how is that going to make me want to engage? Right. Mm -hmm. Only other artists will probably be impressed by this, you know? But everybody else will just kind of be like, whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then as soon as he said that, I looked through my whole portfolio. And essentially, that's kind of how I felt. I was just like, holy crap. Like, everything in my portfolio is very much like what he's saying. It's just there's nothing cool about anything in this whole <laughs> thing that I've put together. You know, what was I thinking? Like, it was just like a really cool drawing of an orc, but like, it wasn't even that interesting of an orc. It was just like a guy with an axe pretty much with like big ears, you know, and yeah. green, <laughs> you know what I mean? It wasn't like a, a, a realized concept. And I think a lot of times people um, will build a portfolio and this is exactly the problem they'll run into is they'll just build a series of images that don't necessarily have a heart to it, you know? No. Yeah. And, um, I'm glad to hear that that's pretty, pretty obvious for not just myself, but for other like, you know, professionals, you know, if you guys check out, um, his artwork on his website, you'll see like, there's a very clear message too. like, there's a very clear tone of like style that you have in your work as well. Realma. Like mm -hmm. it's very obvious to me, <laughs> you know, I'm like, Oh yeah, this guy's all about like more style, you know, more vibrance to his work, you know? So if that was something I'm looking for in my game or my movie, then obviously it's not hard to 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 reach out to you to see if you would like to help work on it. You know? Yeah. Um, where if you go to mine, uh, it's very obvious I'm like all about like those creatures and monsters, you know? <laughs> and I think a lot of times people uh, don't realize that when you're just doing homework assignments and you're just getting a passing grade, that doesn't correlate to actual value you know uh and it, it's it's one of the greatest lies of uh schools that I, I really hate which is this this perception of like you go to college you get you get a degree and then now you have opportunities um yeah. the only real opportunities you get um are from working overseas and it's not because of uh the importance of having a degree right it's because like other countries want you to have a college degree to have a visa that's just like the rules of the land not so much like oh this is like there's clear value in having a portfolio or sorry uh uh there's clear value in having a degree because of x y and z it's like no no we just it's like a more of a formality yeah. <laughs> you know um yeah. like it's like doing cover letters for for companies you know it's it's, it's more of a <laughs> yeah. formality I, i've i've done one recently and um I understand why I got to do it, but you know, the reason why I was even reached out was because of people I worked with at the studio and they're like, Hey, you know, uh, we want you to apply officially, you know, so that way we can have it documented and have it like within our uh, documentation. Um, but whether I get the opportunity to work for the studio or whatever will be almost entirely based off of the fact that I'm qualified, not because I wrote a really good cover letter or because I wrote, uh, or I have a college degree, you know, it's mostly based off of my portfolio and if I'm actually qualified for the job, you know? Yep. I mean, yeah. it's, it's like, and that, that message is even true, like for 
not just like student assignments. I've seen a lot of uh, other artists try to like look at what is trending or popular or what seems like a viable job, uh, mm -hmm. you know, choice. And, you know, you got to be you got to be tactful, right? Like you can't just like, oh, I'm just going to do what I only want to do. And that's it. Like there's got to be a little give and take. There's a little bit of a balance of how you um, navigate, you know, the industry. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, uh, there's some people that show me their work and it's like, it's like, yeah, man, this game is really popular right now. So I did this stuff that looks like it's from that IP. I was like, okay, cool. Like, well, did you enjoy doing this? I was like, no, this was horrible. Like, <laughs> and I was just like, why'd you do it? <laughs> like, why'd you do it in the first place? Like, you, imagine you're going you're gonna to get hired to do this and you're going to have a nine to five. Oh. <laughs> you know, you're going to do work every week doing something that you felt, you know, terrible throughout the whole process. So it's like, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, the, the places where you should feel that something is hard and it's okay um, is probably just in training, right? That's it. Mm -hmm. Like when you're training to, to get better at something. Because when you're trying to build a portfolio, you should ultimately just build the portfolio towards what you actually like to do, to yep. your point, right? And I think yeah. there's, a real, there's a real difference there. Because when people study they um they feel like crap right because they re re it reveals all their weaknesses you know yep. and then when they do their personal work they love it because it's like stuff that they like to do you know but then there's this conundrum right where their personal work isn't that good because they don't have enough skill right and so whenever they do what they like to do it's very enjoyable very fun but then when they um try to train and get better at it it's like complete and utter garbage and and they feel like garbage and it's like there's a real clear difference there but if you're if you are in the opposite camp i think that's also equally as dangerous right where and this to what you're saying where you like let's say you love to practice you love to study because there are people that like to do that they study and study and study like forms all day so for like that that's the only thing they practice right but then when they try to do like a stylized character that doesn't necessarily require like heavy understanding of forms right um and all the training kind of is meaningless in this new exercise right yeah um then they hate it they hate like ah oh, man whatever like you know yeah. and so I, I like to have people ask certain questions right the first question yeah. is like what do you actually want to do right and this is really important because you may not like to do something at first but you know you you like it in general like for instance um, I like character design, right? Um, but it was not enjoyable until I started getting really good at it. You know, it was very challenging. Everything was building a portfolio, uh, and studying both were challenging, but I knew that this is what I like to do because even when I would just draw, like just draw randomly, it would be a character, even if it was garbage, you know? Mm -hmm. So I knew instinctually that there was, there was a real clear connection even though it was always a challenge every day, you know? And I say, ask yourself that question. I think you're right, right? You should be like, what do you like to do? Yeah. Um, and then once you realize that, then you got to train and train and train and train and train. And that's going to be real, real trash. It's going to feel like yeah. garbage day every day. But then eventually you need to build portfolio pieces and you're going to feel good. That's where you should feel safe, right? It's like what Usain Bolt says uh, about tr training versus racing. He says, racing is easy. Training is hard. Right. <laughs> and I think that's how it should be. Like you should feel like whenever you're building, like, like right now, like I'm building brushes and drawing these illustrations and stuff. And it's really easy for me, you know, cause I've really trained a lot, but recently I've been practicing like drawing hands a lot more. And, uh, I've been trying to draw hands now from imagination. I filled up like 10 pages of hands from reference. And, uh, it's very, it's very obvious to me now. Like there's like plethora of faults in my understanding of hands that I am learning from my, my imagination drawings you know and so i have new things to study and practice but it's it sucks you know i hate it you know <laughs> i feel real discomfort you know yeah. uh, but i know i know i have like uh i have foresight i know that right now it's like this feeling but in the future it's going to pay out in dividends you know yeah and so yeah. i think that's really important to ask yourself that question right because uh if you're just doing it because this is the this is the worst reason to do it, and I think this is what you're kind of alluding to, 
you're doing it because you want to get a job, right? And you see that there's a job for that and you want to do that. <laughs> and so you do it, right? And then you don't like it. You don't enjoy it. You just do it because there's a job. Uh, I like to tell the story about my one of my best friends. Uh, he was considered one of the fastest runners in all of California. When he was 18, he ran like a 15 minute three mile, which is incredibly fast and very impressive. And um, for like a high schooler, and he got like scholarships like all over the United States to do very much that, right? Just to run. And um, he turned all these schools down. And I remember talking to him about it and he's like, yeah, I don't like running. Like, I hate <laughs> running. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, I only ran because it was fun to run with my friends because all my friends ran. And I was like, oh, that's such an interesting concept you know he's like yeah i only ran because you know i was hanging out with my buds <laughs> you know i didn't really care so much about the prestige and the records and the medals and all that stuff he's like that stuff was cool too like don't get me wrong you know but clearly uh it was because i was hanging out with my best buds you know and we would just run and go to these meets together and it was fun and it was cool it was exciting you know <laughs> and he ended up going to uh become a linguistic major instead which was like completely removed from uh running you know and he he now is like a director uh project director essentially on vr projects you know uh pretty big ones too like that one that's coming out with the hand tracking that's like him and his team you know uh, the, i'm uh, curious are you talking about white Kalen? yes yeah huh? so he yeah, yeah he was oh, he, what? that was white Kalen. Yeah, he, he used to be a like a track star or cross country star. Oh my god, but I, he, now I can see it. Yeah, he decided not to do that. Um, yeah, he's, a, he's a real nice guy. Yeah, like and and it all started because I he asked me once because he, he was going for like four more years in college and he was just like I don't know man like I don't know about this college stuff <laughs> you know and he's like mm. what what, do you, what should I do and I was like well what do you want to do he's like well I've always wanted to act I was like okay then act then. Like, why aren't you acting? <laughs> and he's like, oh. Oh, yeah, you know what? I never thought about that. <laughs> and uh, and then he, he just started doing that. And then now is like the gateway into like film and production. And he saw like people were using Maya and uh, they were doing a lot of pre-production stuff like um, like the those uh, uh, storyboards with animatics, you know, like the, the 3D animatics. And he started doing those and he getting a real taste for that and uh and then became you know really well known for that and he became really technically good at stuff <coughs> and then that led to him eventually landing the the career he has now you know but it's and he enjoys it he loves it you know and that's kind of my point like you you want to do stuff like this or you want to ask yourself these types of questions and answer them in this type of way you know because yeah. if you don't you you might really lead yourself down a path that's not warranted you know what i mean i mean there's a there's a good quote that I'm I'm gonna be paraphrasing, but it's like you want to do something that you love because when you're all out of energy, when you feel tired and everything like that, it's gonna be the thing that pulls you at the at those points. Because yeah. if you don't really like it and you're exhausted, you're not gonna feel the will of continuing forward. Yeah, I um, I took this same principle to heart. That's why I started the Patreon and the club was because I it genuinely enjoy teaching and helping other artists it is the thing that i have been doing consistently uh pretty well for the last almost for the last decade i'm almost getting there to a decade you know so it's clear to me that this is this is my this is my enjoyment you know like i love to teach if i happen to pick a different discipline you know if i was like a programmer instead right um i would have just been teaching people how to program you know i think yeah. that just was always in the cards for me was to be an educator right and it just happens that i chose art to be really my destiny as a career i really like it art's really fun and creative um but also you know uh teaching is just generically just what i'm default supposed to be doing because even when i was in school uh, me and my buddies would have concept art club which is pretty much ran by me and my buddies and then we would 
do demos for each other and we would like hang out afterwards and give each other instruction and give each other these challenges and tasks, things that I'm doing for the clubs and like uh, my social media. This is kind of what I've done in the past. You know, I've tried a lot of different other things that I've really did poorly at or I wasn't very consistent with. Uh, and I think this is one of those things that I just genuinely enjoy. I think concept art just happens to be the thing that I chose, you know, as a career path. I do enjoy art, uh, but I don't think that I have as much enjoyment from that than I do from just straight teaching, you know, just mm -hmm. education. And so I think that's that has a lot of weight. And I have a student who pretty much they began their art career, you know, doing all sorts of cool concepts and working on big projects. And, you know, he wrote, reached out to me. He's like, you know, I think I know what I really want to do, though. He's like, I think I want to be an educator, too. And I was like, yeah, man, do it. We need more of them. And especially in the field of design, like a lot of professionals, um, there, there's not too many industry professionals who teach like as their full-time job, you know? Uh, and that's including me. I don't think teaching has ever been my full-time job until recently I've decided I'm going to try to make it my priority, you know? Um, and what I mean by industry professionals, people who are still working and making money from working and then on the side, like teaching on a high capacity that can reach more people, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, there needs to be more of that. Because the reason why that has value, at least from my perspective, is that when you, you're talking to somebody who is working in, in an industry currently, that has a lot more weight to it than someone who doesn't, you know? Uh, yeah. Not to say that the people who don't, because I actually learned a lot from people who don't and may have never worked in the industry at <laughs> the capacity that I've worked at or others that I admire, you know? Uh, especially when I was trying to learn game development, I was learning from a lot of people who've never made an actual game that got released. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But I learned a lot, like regardless of that fact. So I'm not trying to discredit this. I'm just saying that there needs to be uh, a balance, right? You want to have some of that kind of education, but also education that's coming from a very pragmatic position, you know? Yeah. And where this person's like dealing with the current affair of the industry and sees it for what it is currently, you know? Yeah. Uh, and give some like solid feedback because uh, a good a good example of this is like AI like that's like becoming a thing and I just saw um, some new technology where you can basically make a, a whole character design just clicking a couple buttons yeah and I'm like yeah dude that's actually pretty cool uh, but I can see <laughs> how people are like flipping out <laughs> and the insecurities are running wild but I'm like uh, I also can see the value of it as like from a perspective professional perspective like of course like a student can probably make like a fake looking portfolio <laughs> but the problem is is that um when it comes down to like grinding or rendering it out that you're not going to be able to necessarily utilize this tool but uh someone like myself i was like oh you know it could be a great basis of a design you know yeah. and there's ways you can like combine your own artwork into this ai to kind of like have your own style infused with two different images you know what i mean and so it's kind of like shortcutting your own <laughs> process and then uh and then just relying on your skill but ultimately uh ai is still not faster than me i'm still faster than these ai like i can still paint and design faster uh on my own than uh using these tools but i can yeah. still see the value in using these tools i'm going to teach how to use them too so people can get ahead of it instead of like getting left behind yeah, I was actually using Art Breeder a lot uh, the past couple of days, just kind of see the, I guess, the limitations of it. And something I found that it's like you can, you can explore an infinite amount of range of uh, designs, but it's almost kind of limited to, uh, almost it's it's almost kind of like finding a design through a decimal point. It's like you have one and two, but you can forever find designs between the two numbers. Sure. And I think humans are going to be the ones that are going to find these different posts or landmarks of different styles mm -hmm. and then hopefully use AI to kind of see the range in between them 
to find something co like something valuable. Yeah, I was talking to a, a machine learning programmer about this when I was in San Francisco recently, and uh, he he was he was saying kind of very similar things. Uh, he's like, ultimately, it's still just a tool, and uh, if if you mess with it, you'll find out like yeah, it's still about like you are in charge of what is the output. If you just rely on like just the default, you know, re like renders, then you're gonna you're gonna kind of come up with the same result as a hundred thousand other people <laughs> who are gonna dabble with the software, right? But if you get in there and you kind of manipulate it and you use your own artistic understanding and style of uh, like basically perspective, you can kind of have a better result. But I was even mentioning to him, it's like, but it's even cooler if you know how to paint because then you can take that design and really manipulate it. And I'm actually going to do some demonstrations about like how that is an, an advantage for someone who actually already knows, has a skill versus somebody who's just gonna use it out of the box. They're just not going to necessarily have as much bandwidth as you might think. But that goes to the point I'm saying like, you know, I think um, for me, education is really valuable and this is why I'm getting back into it in, in a real way, you know? That's why I wanna get like more guests like you they have different perspectives. I think people like what I have to say, but I don't speak for every artist in every industry. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. clear. It's just not, it's not effective. I, and it's really important for me to like also talk to different people because I learn a lot more. Yeah. That's what I love about, I haven't worked <laughs> in a studio in a long time. And what I miss about working in a studio, like in-house specifically, is interacting with other talent and people yep. that have different ideas. Because yep. they just will teach me all sorts of cool stuff that I just never even thought about. Because different people have different walks of life, uh, experiences come from different cultures, and all that adds up to like the individual's art. Uh, and yeah. until we can start uploading our consciousness, uh, or when AI can simulate a human's life experience, which I don't, <laughs> I don't think is is impossible as it sounds. Uh, people might think, oh, that's not going to happen. Well all right <laughs> you know like as soon as you start thinking in this way you're going to be completely blindsided when it does happen you know um yeah. but anyway like the the point i'm trying to make is that you know until then you know i i the only way to really get that experience is to engage with other people right talk to yep. them and be like hey what what do you think about this and they're like i hate this and then they go they're really passionate about their hatred and that passion <laughs> is really in, in educational even if you strongly disagree or agree you know well i think you you learned the kind of the, the context of why it didn't work out for him and then or for that person in that particular mm -hmm. situation and i think that's when you really learn about a process uh, yeah. i had a kind of like this similar experience where i actually taught at a, a master's program um for game development and i was in the art section and one of the things that i saw that was unfortunately uh, a problem with a lot of, and I see this a lot with a lot of teaching and a lot of uh, uh, tutorials online and stuff that you see. Is people try to put this hard, um, I guess, a law on rules or sure. the process or the foundations and not understanding that all these are tools and all uh -huh. the, you know, it's like a chemistry set. You mix this ingredient with this ingredient and you get this reaction. That yeah. reaction is inherently bad. It's just something that you need to know that that's what it does. And hopefully you can find a use for that. Uh, a perfect example is like, I remember the biggest thing that people wanted to teach was, hey, do thumbnails and do thumbnails with a bunch of variations and you, you choose, pick and choose different parts and put it together. Mm -hmm. But in some cases you can Frankenstein your design and that doesn't really work, right? Mm -hmm. So, but. A lot of people just wanted to kind of hold on. It's like, no, this is what you got to do. This is what this is the process of the industry. You have to do this, okay. and yeah, I think it's I think it's very helpful to have people that are in the industry that sees what actually works, and it's also to see the context of it, so that they can inform people out there. It's like, hey, this is just another way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of process, I think it's really important that people understand a couple principled ideas, right? Like uh, I have a lot of students and I make them do thumbnails and it's a really great way to gauge their skill level. And whenever they do these thumbnails, um, 
depending on how well they do, I will give them different feedback. So sometimes someone would submit a thumbnail and it's really uh, abstract, right? It's a little too abstract. Mm -hmm. And I, I will say to them, I was like, look, in an environment where you're working as a professional, this won't work because you're most likely going to be sharing this with other people who are not artists. Mm -hmm. And this is really important distinction, distinction because you would assume that when you work professionally, everybody knows what they're talking about, but nobody does. Not <laughs> everybody knows exactly what the hell they're talking about or even what they want. And, yeah. and worse, a lot of these people may not even know how to explain to you what they want. Yeah. Right. They just know whatever you gave them is not what they want. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so what do you do with that information, which is a lack of information, <laughs> you know, in fact, when I was working on the, the, the music video for League of Legends Worlds uh, that just came out last year, that was specifically my job was to basically translate the words of my writer and producer, right, to these visual effects studios. Because he would be like, ah, there's something weird about this, right? He's like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't, like, I'm not an artist. Like, I don't get it. Like, what's wrong with this? But I know something's wrong with this, you know? And I'm like, okay, well, let me look at it. And I look at it. And I'm like, oh, you know what it might be? It's because of this and this. And, you know, if they were to fix this, I think this is what's wrong. Like, the contrast is, and he's like, oh, yeah, that, okay. And then I'll just, like, do, like, an actual paint over, right? And just visually show what I mean by this, you know, not just explain it with words. And like theory, you know, yeah. I'll just like show, right? Yep. And yep. he'd be like, no, that's like, that is exactly the improvement I was looking for, you know? And I was like, okay, cool. And then I would then put together a video <laughs> and paint over, you know what I mean? That was my phone. It went crazy or something. Yeah, let me turn off my, let me put my mic audio. Oh, yeah, there you go. Uh, and then I'll send them this video and just paint over and the studios themselves would also know what they may need to improve upon, you know, which was helpful yeah. for them, you know, really, really helpful, you know, cause they would just watch my video or look at my paint over and know exactly what they did wrong or what they could improve. You know what I mean? Yeah. That was like, that was like immediately helpful to them. You know yep. what I mean? And, uh, and like if I was just done like thumbnail sketches and kept it abstract, in that context, uh, who knows if it would have been helpful, you know? But like, I was very, very clear. But there's, there's been other instances where I've worked at a studio and we had to have designs done yesterday. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we're really behind. So then doing a series of thumbnail sketches in abstraction is helpful because we can just get a bunch of ideas on an abstract sense, yeah. like out of, the, out of the way without worrying about me sitting down and polishing or having some more realized concepts and then, and then going from there, you know, talking about it then, but even my rough thumbnails are very clear, you know, but I can see how that could still be useful to somebody if they weren't clear. Like if we just had something to go off of. And yeah. I think that's a really important point you're making is that like, I think a lot of times people are really focused on just like one process to rule them all. And yep. I think it's more about instead of, uh, instead of like rules, I think you should look at foundational, um, like foundational truths, right? Yep. Things that are just true, no matter what industry you work in, right? For instance, there is a, a truth to contrast and unity, right? Uh, how well you effectively do these two things. But now, depending on what project you're working on will depend on how you move these things around. But usually a, the reason why an image or something didn't look cool and whatever the fact is, like whatever the project is, is usually because of a lack of control over the contrast of the image or the, the what you call it, the um, unity. So if you take a look at like the Sonic design that came out, it wasn't so much that it was just like completely off the mark of the Sonic design. I think it could still have been a different, unique take on Sonic and it could have been cool. It was like a proportional one, right? Which is like yeah. a lack of uh, contrast. It was too proportionate, which makes it look too humanoid which made it feel real weird, you know? Yeah, the and compositional made... flow was really strange on that. Yeah, like... and I get why they were trying to do that, though, because they were trying to make it continuous amongst this live-action environment. But the reality is it's a cartoon anyway, so it's like, it's kind of like, it's not a big deal, you know? Yeah. You know, we don't need to go E.T. on this. 
<laughs> it's a little too serious, right? <laughs> and so, but like there is a time and place for an ET type of design where it's a little bit more, you know, realistically proportioned or kind of designed. You know, when you look at like something like Star Wars, for instance, that's another good example of places where you could probably put something like that in there and it would work okay, you know? And so there's, but the unity was then in, out of balance because it was not even con, like too, it was too off of like the original design too, you know, in terms of proportion. So I think a lot of that kind of threw people off. But that's like, like again, a universal sense of truth. And you can see that in writing, right? You can see that in uh, animation. Like not, I'm not talking about like animation movies. I mean, the actual movement of a person, right? Like if you, if you listen to like stuntmen talking about how they fall, there's like principal ways to fall and then there's shapes. So they even think about their shape, like the way that they fall to, to also be safe and cool looking, you know, so they don't break a hip, but they like fall in a way that their arms and legs will like be dramatically positioned so that the shape of their body, their silhouette looks dynamic in frame, you know, other than just falling realistically or just falling in general like there's like actually a way to fall you know or get hurt you know that looks dynamic and interesting so there's like these universal truths that you should learn and master and understand and then how you achieve these truths depends on the project kind of kind of going to your point whether you do that with thumbnails whether you do that with line art whether you do that with just straight up painting 3d photo bashing you know it doesn't really matter and in fact in my classes i tell people at some point when they realize like, I don't care how you submit your work, you know, it just gotta be good. And I'm pretty knowledgeable about all these different processes that I can help guide you to do it better. You know what I mean? So if you're doing photo bashing, I know how to do that. So let me show you how you should do that and the examples you should be taking notes from, right? Like why your photo bashing looks like hot me like a hot mess, you know, versus like ex artist who's like a pro at it, you know? And, or if you do 3D, like, oh, well, this is why your 3D is a hot mess. Again, and here's artists that you should be looking at, right? I'm not going to say never do 3D, never do <laughs> thumbnailing, never do this or that. And it's to your point, which is a great point. You know, like, there's no perfect, only one way works for all uh, method. But I will say that the best method, uh, in my experience, is the one where you have a lot of clarity in your designs. Okay. The yep. more clear your designs are, I think universally works in all sorts of uh, jobs. You know, the more clear your image is, the more people can understand what the heck they're critiquing. I don't know if this is true for you. Well, I mean, for stylized stuff, like, I think that that clarity kind of coincides with uh, a compositional flow of a design or a character or even a scene. If your movement through your image, through the audience's eyes is, you know, it's getting the information across, it's getting the mood across, a lot of things like anatomy, perspective, all that stuff can be looked over because the movement, the dynamics of your image still holds up. And I think that kind of goes along, along the side with clarity. Cool, man. It's like a strong intention, you know? Like what are you what are you intending with this painting? What do what do you want people to really see and focus on? And I think that definitely goes along inside with that clarity. Yeah, dude. Yeah, um, I think this is a good time to start taking questions, actually, too. Uh, if you down, you down to take some questions, my man. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and right. uh, before we get into that, <laughs> um, we're also going to be having we're going to try to get you to come to Seattle. Well, you're are you already out in Seattle? I forget. No, 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 no. You're Come on, right. I'm an SLC, yeah. Salt Lake City. That's right. <laughs> so we're going to try to get you out in Seattle too to, to help do some workshops with us. I think it'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. That and sounds cool. So, um, so if you're interested, again, Mike, can you share a link to the, what you call it? The mailing list. Mailing list. So that way we can get a scope of yeah. um, how many people are going to be, be able to come and then start putting tickets and sales out there so we can fly our, us artists out. We've done it for the New York event and it went uh, completely uh, great. Like it was super awesome. We were able to fly out everybody, no problem. Uh, it was specifically just me. And then we were able to like get the venue and all that kind of stuff. And then like uh, we were even able to uh, book a venue to, 
to party and hang out after the whole event was done. Um, so we want to try to keep this type of momentum of this kind of like robot pencil thing to go uh, constant because it's a cool idea and I think it's a great way to bring art artists to artists instead of you know people flying out to these great events that are all around the states. It's best to kind of bring them to you, you know, locally. So yeah. anyway, all right, let's go to questions. Okay, so first question is from Hassan Raza. Cool. Okay. Yes. Hey, AJ, your work seems like very finished slash polished, although what makes the artwork cool? Wait, what? <laughs> I, I'm, I read them as they're written. Okay. Read it hey, again. AJ, I'll, your I'll work. More... Yeah. Hey, AJ, your work is seems like very finished slash polished. Uh -huh. Although, what makes the art work cool? Got it. I think. I think he's like trying to decipher like, why. why so yeah. You know, why? Why does it feel good? Like to look at and or cool in general. Well, um, I like I was just talking about. There's like these universal truths, right? <laughs> And if you can kind of hit on these truths, then your artwork will tend to, to be received well. You know, like I, I can show my artwork to even like a non-artist and they will have some visual reaction. Now, whether it's their genre of art that they like to engage in, like obviously if you do more QC fun style uh, art, that has much more of an appeal and a larger on the masses. And the reason why is that there's a lot of familiarity there. And that's why that stuff usually works better. Where my stuff... Uh, the, it it teeters on familiar, right? But it definitely has a lot of abstraction to it. But the thing that balances it out, that makes it look interesting, even if you're not into weird, like super surreal looking artwork, is that I really make an effort um, to make the designs, like the shapes and the patterns look nice, right? And I follow a lot of design principles that I've learned over the years. Uh, there are specifically surrounded around shapes uh, and values. And then I'm also getting more and more evolved when it comes to color, but uh, essentially it's shapes and values. And I use unity and contrast interchangeably. So if I have an image that has a lot of contrast, then I'll find a way to unify all of it. If I have an image that has very little contrast or that's very unified, but has very low contrast, then I'll try to find more ways to contrast it. And I just balance out between these things. I don't tell stories in my images. I just make really good images based off of these principal ideas uh, as, as often as I can. I don't do it all the time, but I can do it pretty consistently, which is a, which is a definitely a staple of a professional, right? You are a professional if you can do something on a constant basis, right? Uh, if you can't do it on a constant basis, then you're probably not going to be as um, professional as you might want to be. But yeah, that's 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 my answer. Okay, um, Nihal says Ethan Becker just talked about your style in his new video. Yeah, I just watched uh, a little bit of it right now before the, we started. I'll have to check that out. I didn't know about that. Um, Quintonis says, uh, "How are some professional artists able to sell fan art online or at conventions? Are there no consequences for selling someone else's designs anymore?" <laughs> yeah so so the reality is this and this might not be something that my peers would like to hear or anybody who does fan art um unless it's like a real change of pace of the design and it has to be like a pretty hold on i think it's just my phone but i thought i put my phone on I didn't how know. unprofessional i am unprofessional <laughs> And I'm going to charge my phone too. I'm going to charge my watch a little bit more too. So <clears throat> the thing that I think people don't realize, and again, it has to be like mostly like satire or some sort of fair use. But even in that situation, you might be shocked that um, you are not allowed to, to do fan art in principle. And, and what I mean by this is that like, you're right, like, you just can't. It's actually illegal in a lot of countries and states. And so let me give you an example of um, fan art that you shouldn't or you couldn't or you can't do. Uh, like let's say you're just doing a revised vision of like Pikachu or something, right? 
and maybe making Pikachu a little bit cooler looking and there's it's, it's not too similar to the style but it's pretty similar right but it's like a little bit evolved that generally falls in line with like you know companies could do something about it right if you took Pikachu and mixed it in with like Game of Thrones, right? Like you put Pikachu in Game of Thrones, right? And you made a really unique take on that, then that would not be something that you would get in trouble for. All right. So anything that's like pretty much uh, in between that, like from like the stylized, like a little bit of advanced version of a Pikachu drawing to a more like like a cross breeding of two different genres of different fandoms um you're 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 always in in some sense of danger and the reason why and it might seem like well that seems weird like like you're just doing artwork of this company why can't i just you know show my love for them and then you know maybe make some money from my efforts the reason why is because we need to protect intellectual property and it seems weird at the scale of like a large company like Disney or like the Pikachu studio, I forget their name. Um, guys, who make sure it's just Pokemon. No, Isn't no, no, there's, the there, there's, there's a name for their company. I forget what it is. Uh, hmm. Or any other of these like game freaks. Know, um, no, it's something else. No, game freak just owns the license to the games. It's, it's available by simple Google search. I just don't know it uh, off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, and so uh, what I'm trying to get at is like, yes, on a large scale, it seems kind of like, well, who cares, right? But it's a, it's a smaller scale where it starts to become a problem. So for instance, let's say somebody took one of my characters that I've done and they've made a 3D sculpt of it or they made a, um, uh, a fan art painting of it, which I've seen many of this, right, online. Uh, I could, if I wanted to, say, hey, like, you can't do that. And in most cases, and pretty much almost like 99% of the time, I don't do that because I think it's fine, you know? Especially in these cases because people are just doing it because they're trying to learn or they're just showing their love for my work, right? So it's clearly harmless. But if they were to, like, build, like, a whole portfolio and built a whole, like, uh, website and uh, they started selling prints, as you said, uh, of artwork that's very clearly similar to mine, right? Uh, that's 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 clearly a problem, isn't it? You know, because that's my aesthetic, that's my style, that's my stuff, and you can see from that scale, it's like, oh well, yeah, duh. But that's my point. Like, if we can't protect those who are larger scale because we're punishing them for their success, then you can see then that would actually trickle down to us mm-hmm. smaller developers, right, and affect us negatively, and it would actually hurt us more. You know, a great example of this is Mike Mignola and Hellboy. Mike Mignola, by no stretch of the imagination, is like this multi-millionaire, like billionaire (laughs) franchise owner, right? Like he owns a franchise that has a lot of value, Hellboy, you know? And he still goes, you can go to a con and meet this guy. You know what I mean? Like you could talk to him. He's a nice guy. He's, He's available, you know? Like that's how, like he's still kind of like a human, if that makes sense. And uh, there was a story he talked about, I think he told it or someone else told it, where somebody was selling Hellboy prints. And again, this wasn't like a complete evolution. It was like fan art of Hellboy, but they were selling Hellboy prints. And this is Mike's IP. And they went to his booth. And because it's so nonchalant, this whole idea of fan art, right? The guy didn't even think anything of it. He like went up there and he's like, man, I'm like a big fan of yours. Like, uh, my Hellboy prints are the ones that sell the most. Like your, like your character design is like, like clearly beloved. And the guy didn't even realize what he was saying. You know, he's like, "Hey, this thing that you made that I just basically copied, <laughs> I'm selling it in my booth and making money from it." And obviously, Mike was really upset about this, but he didn't necessarily what to do. He didn't know what to do because this is a fellow artist. He didn't want to like destroy this person's like livelihood all of a sudden. You know. Like, is that, because he, he genuinely believed that this person wasn't trying to, like, trying to do it maliciously, you know? And so he had to educate him. He's like, hey, man, like, you, you got to, like, reconsider that because I'm also trying to sell Hellboy prints, you know? 
<laughs> you know, and it's my project. And I think the guy uh, took it very obviously. I think he took it well. I'm not sure. I don't remember the, the details of the story, but I'm trying to make it seem like it was very, it was a hopefully optimistic ending. But the idea, the point is, is that the, the, the message that was being said was that, hey, this is my IP and I don't remember giving you permission essentially to license this and make money from it, you know? Because if you license, you have to purchase that license, right? Like let's say you want to do artwork and you want to sell it, right? On your own store or whatever, then you have to pay the original owner of the project or product, right? In some way, whether that's like complete ownership of it, like in that specific media or a license fee, like you can borrow it uh, for a limited amount of time, right? This is a great example of the spider-man situation that happened with like spider-man and uh, sony and disney so sony bought the rights to make spider-man movies okay and they bought it for 10 million dollars a long time ago and their contracts were freaking solid <laughs> okay they essentially all they had to do is make a spider-man movie every 10 years so they can renew their contract if they didn't then marvel would essentially obtain it back and so obviously Disney has now owned Marvel and Marvel is this huge movie empire, right? The movie, the Marvel movies. So obviously Sony is like, or uh, Disney is like, hey man, like, you know, let's let's work out a deal. Let's 50-50 it, man, you know? And Sony's kind of like, because you have to think of it from their position, Sony owns Spider-Man movies. They've made all of like the great Spider-Man movies, including the one of my favorite ones, which is Spider-Verse, right? And... So they essentially own the rights to the movies, so they don't need to give Disney anything, <laughs> right? And and I was actually in the camp of Sony. I know a lot of people weren't, but I was in defense of Sony. I was like, no, 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 like Sony has made great Spider-Man movies. They they made some of the best ones. They've also made some weird ones, but they are the kind of one the first people to actually make Spider-Man a household name. You know, really. You know, it was like, so to kind of ignore that, it was be disrespectful, right? And Disney already owns too much stuff anyways. <laughs> so maybe, maybe having this dual ownership is a, is a healthy relationship, you know, kind of bring a, make some humbleness, have a Disney have some humbleness to them, you know? And, but yeah. Disney, you know, they, they're flexing, man. They're trying to buy it for billions, billions of dollars, you know, like multi-billions. Not like a one or two billion, like several billions. And it sounds like a lot of money, but I mean, the the last few Spider-Man movies made together like three or four billion dollars. So yeah, Sony is not going to budge. And so to the to this ultimate point is that fan art and ultimately, and maybe I will do like a whole YouTube video about this and like give examples, like very direct examples and talk about great good practices with fan art that actually are very helpful uh, and actually are good for your portfolio even, right? Uh, but if you're just doing like a really cool version of a character, um, you got to be very careful of that because uh, the companies, if you start to really make some real money, the companies can and will sue you. And that's where the real point is, I should really point out, is that you got to make some real money. If you're just going to cons and stuff like this and there's no real like immediate sense of like you're stealing or taking the bank, you know, they're, they're kind of going to leave you alone because it's actually going to be more expensive to take you to court. All right. And battle it out. than it is to just let you just deal with it. And plus it's, it's most, it is mostly harmless. And most of the time people don't really are trying to um, hurt these studios that are trying to show their appreciation. But I think this idea of we should just side with the little guy in this uh, needs to be judged case by case you know what i mean context yeah because because we don't want to fall into the camp of completely defending the little guy where the copyright laws then actually turn on the little guy uh without even knowing it you know what i mean uh, and we want to make sure that uh, ownership of projects and ideas are very strong okay and if they're strong f for the little guy they're gonna have to be strong for the big person too you know it just seems wrong, right? Because they're so much bigger. I understand that. And yeah, context matters uh, deeply, you know? Because there are some instances where I think fan art is entirely harmless. But let me give you a great example of one where people were like really pissed. 
when the company went down on them, like went down on them, like came down on them. <laughs> <laughs> where uh it was the the guy who made like the complete fan art of uh like he made like a fan game of the pokemon like he made like a whole pokemon game you hear about this yeah yeah he, like he this. just made like a completely brand new pokemon game with like unique characters and storyline and he released it for the, free it was one that was an mmo yeah. yeah i'm not sure if it was an mmo or not but it was like a big game and he released it for free well, there's several projects oh. yeah and they immediately were like nope cease and desist right and people are like what but he's like putting it out for free and all this stuff and everything and they're like yeah that's cool but like like what if we want to build a pokemon game that's similar to this right in the future and there's going to be brand confusion you know like this is not an official pokemon game by any stretch of the imagination and even if he goes out of his way to explain that it isn't some people still might not know and you, you, most people, you guys will are smart enough to know what I mean. Like, just because somebody says, like, it's like with news, like when uh, news outlets will get something wrong and they'll change the the facts to the real facts, right? Or they'll adjust their correction, but it's already too late, right? When it spreads, that information is already out there, and people already start to believe in this false information. You know, so it's the same with like IP development. So like they they have to squash it like immediately. You know what I mean? Because uh, that is a, that is a real thing, brand confusion, you know. Yeah, I mean okay, that's, that's me, what uh, China does. China does this a lot, right? They like Nike. They'll say nice. <laughs> they like literally just confuse the brand name. I had a nice shirt. It was nice. It said nice instead of Nike, and it had the the check, but it was like a little bit different. And I was like, oh wait, this is not actually a Nike shirt. But from afar, it would have looked like one, you know. So anyway, okay. that's my thoughts on fan art. Yeah. I don't know if uh, you had some thoughts. Real, I mean, yeah, I you, know, you have any thoughts? You've done fan art before. Yeah, oh, I think you do like mash. You do mashups. Yeah, I do mashups and stuff like that. But I've never really sold prints or anything like that of fan art. I think for me, like fan art's okay. Uh, I do fan art because I actually enjoy the property or, or the IP. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I go like, you know, this convention I did uh, recently here, like I'm selling most of the stuff is all my stuff is pretty much original that I've created. And it's not to say that I want, I think every artist should do this, but for me personally, I want to find, you know, that person's personality in their work. And I want to look at that. I want to see what you have to offer. That's new. That's personalized to you, to the art community. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, for me, I think that's that's what I would like to see more of. But in yeah. terms of like you doing fan art, go ahead. If you really like it, awesome. If you're doing it to you know take money and like, I think you should research and like think about the things that like Anthony said. Like, what are yeah. the logistics of it? Be intelligent, man. Don't just do it yeah. because everyone else does it. You got to be. Yeah. Um, you you got to just keep this in mind. I think this is really simple. This is a really simple question you should ask yourself. Um, you should ask yourself this idea that would anyone be confused with this and their original content in yeah. any way? Um, so if you did like a mashup, that's very unlikely they're going to get confused, right? Like it's going to be, oh yeah, well clearly this is like a mashup. This is not probably a brand. Uh, and it falls into satire even, right? So it's clearly like safe, but it's like, a little bit more polished version of Pikachu or just like a rendered version of Pikachu. You might think, well, nobody's like, they don't do that. Right. Well, they just released detective Pikachu, which is a rendered version of Pikachu. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. like, you might want to like kind of take a step back and ask yourself, uh, yeah. if it's and, safe. and in some cases, uh, they're still okay with that. And they're like, ah, that's fine. You know? Cause again, yeah. they'd rather not deal with all the backlash and the legal ramifications of it. It's not worth the money, you know, and time. Uh, yeah. But in some cases, like the the whole building the whole Pokemon game, they're like, no, this could be big. Like millions of people might download this game, you know. And so we gotta shut it down like real quick. <clears throat> hey, like, um, sorry, real quick. Would you guys be interested in having real Madraw for this this last half while we take questions? You can uh, share a screen right here. You can just full screen it. Oh yeah, maybe. Let's try. Yeah, it. sure. It'd be really easy. Yeah. It's up to you two. Yeah, let's do it. 
I'm kind of done already. I just wanted to do these like yeah. I look. Maps. I'm looking, and usually you're done. But, no. <laughs> yeah. but uh, we're, we got more <laughs> questions, and it'd be yeah, cool to see Rioma Doodle. All right, right Rioma, just uh, you know what's up. Share your screen okay. or whatever. You start I'm doodling, do whatever. Know what um, to answer your guys' question on on the Pokemon thing, uh, it looks like it's very complicated. So it seems that uh, the Pokemon Company is what owns Pokemon, but then the shareholders in Pokemon Company include. Uh, Nintendo Game Freak and a company called Creatures. Okay, cool. Um, I'll be right so back. Let me get some water while you explain yeah, this. So it's, it's, it's owned by uh, multiple parties. And so, yeah, it makes licensing confusing. Um, I'm, there's a long article on it. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll um, link it in the chat for you folks if any of you are curious All about right. Pokemon. Let's lightning around this last one. Okay. And we this got, is, we got, this uh, is nice. I, I didn't. I realized that the Discord has this feature. And in the future, I've been telling by the you way, for days, you have been telling for me days. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> not listening. Just have it implemented. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah. I've listened to you. It's just that I willfully ignored it. That's all. <clears throat> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, in the future, too, I think we're going to, we could probably get in patrons in here, too, and hang out. Maybe we can do some guest appearances. That could be cool. Maybe uh, cause yeah. I'm going to do some larger challenges on the Patreon on the club where they're going to be like a big okay. challenge, like a big task. You know what I mean? Do like a show and tell. And uh, take some of the best ones and maybe bring them into the chat. That could be cool. And we can talk about art. Talk about arts. Anyway, lightning rounds. Cool. We got a question for Adam. So uh, okay. uh, Anton says, hey, Adam, cool work. Can I ask for what Adam. the principal? Uh, his name is Adam Riomotezzi. Oh, chill. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, cool work. Uh, can I ask what the principle of stylization is? Um, I know about proportions and simplification, but my stuff still looks boring. Um. Yeah, I, I think that compositional flow throughout your design is like extremely important for um, like more of a kind of stylized type of take. So it do you, and what I mean by that, do you have like a nice movement throughout your piece? And this is something I actually learned a lot heavily from like doing stuff for League of Legends. They, in their isometric view, they want to make sure that there's a lot of like nice movement through their designs. And it's also kind of keeping your eye moving throughout the character. So there's a lot of things to kind of like for in the context of this to avoid where it's like having design compositional flow that moves your eye away from the character. So, and just like little things like that, like, and also figuring out what kind of mood you want to portray onto the character and how are you going to have that work with the comp, the whole composition. But I think composition is a huge thing, man. Like I say that a lot because uh, a lot of times I find that composition is going to be a thing that people pay attention to the most and your accuracy of your anatomy, your accuracy of, you know, uh, perspective is going to be, will be overlooked if your composition holds up really nicely and has a nice appeal to it. All, All right. right, next one, next question. Omega Panda asks, if you are, if you are self-taught and trying to join a company for the first time, would you join as a junior artist? What's the difference between senior slash junior in concept art and illustration? Yeah, so it's, it's not too, too different in terms of what you actually do usually like a senior concept artist and a junior concept artist usually do the same kind of work at least from my experience what usually differenti differentiates the two is just the experience yeah so like a senior artist will just probably get paid more and probably get put on some more larger more heavily responsible tasks you know but it doesn't necessarily mean that the junior artist will never get those tasks either right? Maybe they just get less of them, right? Because I was a junior artist when I was working at Sony, but they made me like work on a boss, you know, like the last boss, <laughs> you know what I mean? Where um, they had Izzy, who was more senior, work on a lot of, lot more bosses than I did. Like worked on a couple more, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like if there was 10 bosses, he worked on like eight of them and I worked on two of them. So it wasn't like I didn't do, but like, oh, junior level, can't I even do a but No, they, they hire artists that they think can do every single thing that they need them to do. You know, it's not a matter of like there's junior tasks and then there's senior tasks 
it's like no there's just tons of tasks and we need tons of artists who are all really good you know and then if you're a junior most likely it just means you're just less experienced like you're just really green you know and you're, you're just gonna learn more where seniors are just like they're just in and out you know what i mean uh, a lead concept artist would be someone who's in charge of the concept art team. They would be like telling them, like they would be giving them feedback in the general sense, and they'll be working with them. They're the ones that go to meetings more often, right? Where the senior and junior artists tend to just work, make a lot of art, you know. At least that's from my experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, something that I can add to that is just like, um, a. A, a senior concept artist is going to understand the relationship between their design to all the different departments and also the different parts of production. Yes, I agree. So, uh, for example, let's say you're creating a character that is for a mobile space and you know it's going to be 3D and you also know that there's going to be design constraints because it's going to be on a mobile space. So you have to design something with uh, bone, bone density in mind. And what I mean by bone density, how many joints they're going to be because that takes you know uh, resources from the phone so and also how much of a texture space you're going to have like all those things um a senior artist is going to have a better experience of understanding and i think that's going to be the, the thing it's not just can you make a good design can you make a good design in context of all the limitations and all the conditions that are set within a production yeah yeah just more experience, <laughs> like more knowledge. And I think this is really important to understand too, because even with that senior level experience, it seems like it's not that hard to learn, even at a junior level, right? Like you may, it may take you a few months to really understand what all of what Realma just said, right? Like, like to truly understand like what an animator has to do, what the bones and rigging has to do, what the 3D modeler has to do. Like that kind of education doesn't actually take too long to acquire, especially when you're working in a studio and you have constantly your art director and your producers telling you, these are the constraints. These are the constraints, you know? At some point you're gonna realize, oh, these are the constraints, you know? And if you don't adapt to them, obviously you might end up losing your job, right? So you're gonna adapt quickly and you're gonna learn quickly. And what it will do in terms of experience to what you're saying, your point, is that when you work at multiple different studios, you'll have a broader understanding of all these different kind of mechanics because it might be a lot different for different types of projects. So that's where it comes from. But I also kind of want to make sure that people realize that just because someone is senior, right, uh, doesn't entirely mean you should get paid less, like really, really low, or that you are not as qualified as someone who's senior. There are people who are, I know who are senior level artists that are not nearly as good as people who would clearly be a junior level artist in terms of experience, right? But in terms of actual quality of work, there are people that are not working currently, like I have students like this, who are would be considered junior, specifically for the reasons we just talked about. But I, I imagine after like a half a year working at an actual studio, they'll be, they'll be right up there with some of the best, you know? <clears throat> and so I think it's really important to understand that focusing on your work, don't worry about this whole experience stuff um, too much because you will learn these types of things on the job. Yep. Um, but what you can't learn on the job is to be a good designer. That is something that they expect you to just already have, right? Uh, what you can't learn on the job is how to paint well. You should already have that skill as soon as you walk into the door, you know? They're not going to teach you how to be a better artist, but they can teach you production or even if they don't teach you, you'll learn indirectly, you know? And it's not, it, your your job is not hinged on if you don't really understand how a rigger rigs, right? But you understand how bones are rigged and how that relates to your art, that you can learn really quickly. And it's now just a matter of adjusting your already developed skills to that workflow, which usually isn't that hard of a transition. Usually it, is, it isn't. And if you are working with competent art directors and producers, they hired you knowing that that wouldn't be much of a hurdle anyway, you know? Uh, but there is a chance you might get hired by incompetent producers and art directors who may <laughs> not realize that you need a lot more training. So if that's the case, you should be very aware of that situation and try to adapt as quickly as possible, right? 
don't remember like don't assume everybody knows what they're doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah because as soon as you knew assume that you know everyone knows what they're doing you're gonna you might fall on your face real fast yeah. and it might not be your fault of your own okay dan robnett asks when you when you're gonna finish your art station tutorial <laughs> no i need to really do this uh i'll do yeah, it still promoting it when they go when you go to the page yeah, so. man. and i want to do it i'm gonna do it um here's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna do it this week i've actually Good. freed up most of my time this week anyway so i'm gonna put it down i have tasks and i might actually do it tonight i have time tonight so. there you go dan making a difference no that's important <laughs> i like to be accountable man it helps that's why I got Mike too, man. Mike tells me what's up. <laughs> All right. So sometimes you listen. <laughs> and sometimes I listen. Yeah, I listen a lot of times. It just takes. I, I'm just giving you shit. It takes Sorry, time man. just for me to get to it usually, uh, but I mm -hmm. do listen. I think you have valuable insight. <clears throat> anyway. Okay, let's get keep going real um, soon. Because as soon as I give it to them, it goes up like in a day, a day or two. It doesn't take them long. Cool. No, so, no, uh, Randall Anton... too. He's been like, he's like, hey man, you, you alive, dude? I'm like, yeah, I am. Just uh, sorry. A lot's going on. Okay, are you ready for the next question? Yep. Yes, sir. Okay, Anton asks AJ, can you invite Trent Kanigura? Gura, Ga? Trent. Uh, he's also a YouTuber and concept artist. I know who you're talking about. I can't pronounce his name though. Sure. Um... You Maybe guys I can reach out to him, him or that. Yeah, you guys and tell him what's him up. Uh, send me his Instagram right now if you guys know it, and I'll message him directly after this, too. But you guys um, should, okay. you should be like, hey man, yeah, I'll get it because they can't post links. Guys, get it somehow. Hack our YouTube, <laughs> post it, you get the ability oh, to post. Links. I'm drawing, give you his, I'm drawing hands too name. right now while you're drawing, I'm sketching. So you guys might see me looking straight down. That is me looking down at my little sketchbook. Still drawing. Um, mm -hmm. oh. Okay, I'll get that over to AJ for you, and uh, maybe we can set that up. I already uh, I reached out to Carla Ortiz on Twitter, and she said she's really really busy. Oh, she's but busy. I'm gonna send an email to her, and we'll see if we can get her on as well. Yeah, I can. Uh, I got some buds too. I reached out to a bunch of buds. All right. We'll so, uh, like Goma, at least one person every week. That'd be cool. That'd be great. Yeah. And plus, if uh, now that you're using the Discord, uh, like I set up, you can have them do demos <laughs> as well. <laughs> All right. Um, Goma asks Are uh, dates locked in for Seattle meetup for those who want to travel and hang out? Uh, they uh, I thought semi we are, the semi ninth. Are. Yeah. Semi uh, I think are. the ninth and the 12th through the 12th. But I'm not going to confirm until we get like some real numbers on the on this seattle mail we're list. shooting for we're shooting for mid-april so it'll be right after Just... my birthday i'll be 36. oh wow okay um boomer anyway <laughs> <laughs> uh alexander says <laughs> did, you, did you see that kylo ren uh huh? have you seen the latest kylo ren um undercover boss like he did one like years ago no. it was hilarious and it's like yeah, undercover boss comes back right he comes back again <laughs> And he's trying to like fit in with all the young employees. So he's like, he's making all these jokes and he's like, eh, okay, boomer. And then he just oh, says yeah. it and it's really funny. And then there's like a the last, the last scene of it. It's super funny. Like there's, I didn't, a, I didn't know he owned any businesses. No, the whole idea was that like, he was like the supreme leader of like the, like he's just the emperor. So he's like the boss. Oh, it was a skit. Was it on a That's Saturday Night Live? Yeah. Oh dude, I want to see that then. That sounds hilarious. The latest one's really funny at the end. That's a funny uh, context, like undercover boss. The first but one's like... really funny, and the second one I think is pretty funny. Not as funny as the first one, though. But it was really funny. The Empire. <laughs> oh man. Um. Are you ready for disaster? You are not ready for the dark side. What the, the power is within us? What's going anyway, on? Anyway, um <laughs> <laughs> I'm the undercover boss. Uh, yeah. uh okay, next question. So Alexander says, When did you understand that you'd like to create characters, not landscapes? 
I'll let you take that one, man. I ain't talking too much. Um, because you do most of the characters that, too. Yeah, I, I like characters a lot. I think I just because there's a lot of kind of complexity in terms of like where where they are in terms of like a narrative sense, uh, why they are the certain way, what may have happened in their past, and how that it affects their their mood and look. Um, but as I don't know, as time goes by, like I feel like the narrative experience is also found. I mean, it's definitely found within the environment, within mm-hmm. a space. So I like to explore. Now I like to explore the character with the environment because that is a dynamic that's very interesting, uh, and giving that that information. So yeah, um, I think characters just because naturally in the beginning it was like something that I paid attention to more when I was a kid. But as time goes on, I find that it's that that experience can be found anywhere with anything. Yeah, I um I'm just a character person. I like people. I'm a people person. I like characters. And uh specifically what I like about characters is the the fact that you know, we interact with people very often and I like the sensibility that I'm designing new people. I'm not a world builder type of person too. I'm not like movies that do heavy world building. I'm not a fan of uh, projects, video games that are like this. I'm not a fan of in terms of engaging in it and playing these games. Working on them, I feel differently. But um, that's generally why. But yeah, I'm, I agree with you too. It just depends on what you prefer. Usually when people don't know, because I, I like everything. Because I technically like everything too, right? Uh, I usually say, well, look at your portfolio and like, what do you draw more of? Do you draw more portraits or figures or do you draw more landscapes and environments, you know? And whatever that is, do that and focus in on that for a long time. And then you can come back and flirt with the other ones because I can still do environments here and there too, you know? But yeah, don't don't be, um, don't be fickle. Like try to pick one so you can get really good at it. Yeah. There's plenty of time to get good at all this stuff. There really is. If you live a long, healthy life, but um, you're not going to get imagine? anywhere quickly if you just kind of like just focus. Don't focus on one. Okay, so we have four more questions, and then we're going to end the stream. Okay. Um, the next question is from Matthew. It says, "Been in the industry for 13 years, animating yes. on shows, ArcViz, etc. I want to shift gears. What skill is rare in the industry?" Where there is, where is there a need? Uh, there's just needs for all sorts of stuff still. Yeah. Um, but I would say it's going to start to slowly become more and more prevalent. The like artistic fluency, right? Like, like we were just talking about AI. Like, we you're going to need people that just have a real good artistic fluency and creative fluency, meaning that they know how to explain and talk about art in a consistent and concise way that other people can also um, learn from, right? Because that's obviously going to be valuable as an educator, but also just as like a project lead, uh, a creative lead, because a lot of the jobs that require mundane just art creation can be mitigated by only one or two people now instead of like a whole team of people right if you think about like animation like a lot of that can be motion motion captured now and it's going to be so easy to do that like you can do it on your phone eventually right like someone can just videotape you doing the actions so ai will be able to decipher how you moved and then basically apply it to a non-rigged character because they won't even need to rig the character because it will just deform the vertices right you'll just know and that tech already exists, <laughs> okay? So it's not, a, it's not a fictional scenario. It's just that it's not really reliable yet. And that's only going to get easier and easier. And even like animation, like real beautifully animated characters, that's going to be automated too because there's a lot of content that's available that you can throw into machine learning and then you can just, again, sliders, you know? So there's going to be a lot of like people who just need to know how to do things well and effective so i think creative like jobs like concept art uh concept art previs uh storytelling or storyboarding i mean like stuff that requires a lot of like the front end of development like a lot of previs jobs um are going to be also production now because the only reason why you have previs is to save time in production but if the previs artist or the artists are in 
in the front lines can just like if I sculpted a character based off of my design, right? Or I design a painting and then it, like a software sculpts it like 90% of the way and I finish the sculpt, the other 10%. And then I get my camera phone and I videotape me moving or they get an actor to do the movements and then bam, it's rigged, movement, it's textured, colored, all that stuff, you know? All those other jobs that would come after normally would start to slowly disappear, right? Like a person who would have to model my character. If there's already software and tools that will allow me to either create my model immediately or can kind of create it for me a little bit. You're going to still need your, your technicians and your people that are going to clean up, but I don't think that's the job that you necessarily want based off of what you're asking, you know? But uh, being on the front lines. But even those jobs, I think, ultimately will be gone, right? Where anybody, like a person with a very limited amount of skills can just make a whole movie or video game by themselves, you know what I mean? Using all sorts of great tools and technology. That's already true now with using marketplace assets and such, you know? But it's only going to become more obviously true in the next five years, probably. So some sort of frontline job, I think, is important. An educator, because uh, people, even if they know the job's not practical, they still like to learn how to do stuff. You know, people still like to learn to do things. You know what I mean? Like, I'm learning Spanish. There's no real practical application to this that's going to make me money. It's just so I can talk to my wife in Spanish. You know? People still like to learn stuff. So there's going to still be people that want to learn how to draw digitally. Just because they want to. Yeah, something something I can see is that it's kind of going along with what you said about art fluency. Uh, I think it's also, I can see that being expanded in the whole creative process. Uh, a lot of things what's happening right now is that because of the internet, there's an overload of just like information mm -hmm. just online. And people are able to kind of pick and choose and take a lot of things and just like they're able to craft something because there's so much content out there to grab. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a, a lot of people that don't understand how to mix them all together. Mm -hmm. And I see a little bit of parallels with uh, what's happening with music right now. We have a lot of lo-fi hip hop, a lot of uh, people just taking samples and putting it together. And mm -hmm. it's you have a lot of junk that's out there that they just took all these things that they thought was popular, put it together, and then they thought it was going to make something beautiful, but it wasn't. And I think uh, a lot about what creativity is, is uh, your relationships with the content that you put, you know, the arrangement of your content. And I'm hoping that as time goes on and, you know, as there's because there's YouTube, because, you know, there's robot pencil mentorships, there's people doing mentorships like they people are going to learn that, hey, you know, how do I contextualize all these things together to make something that is very impactful and um uh, yeah, uh, you see, like even big companies right now, they're they're suffering for it because they have people say, "Hey, put that put that thing in there, yeah. put that mechanic in there, put that art style in there," and it's not a cohesive experience, and it bothers people. It's not even just artists; it's just the average gamer. It's like, "Whoa, this feels weird. This doesn't feel right." So, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that you know that skill level is going to be a little bit more, um, I guess prioritized for the industry because I want my, I want my industry to be healthy not just financially but even creatively so yes sir okay Andrew says uh, what's your system your daily habits and you can both answer this <laughs> yeah again we got to do lightning around I keep talking too much um, <clears throat> so um, I'm actually evolving mine right now I've been playing this video game called Clash Royale too much. And I'm not even good anymore at it. I can't pass a certain threshold and I get really frustrated. And I'm like, when I start cussing at my phone, um, that's when I know that I am wasting my time on this thing. If I'm going to put myself through some pain, it's going to have some value, <laughs> you know? And there's no value in just getting good at this game. I don't have any long-term plans. It's supposed to be a relief, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> So then I started to switch um, uh, projects. I'm gonna or switch like things to to engage myself with. So I got Duolingo, and so I'm learning Spanish again. Uh, I enjoy it. 
I enjoy learning, so I think, yeah, that's fine. So I'm going to do this this now, um, and then I'm going to start to monitor my activity on my phone. But generally, in the morning, I'm going to spend my time learning stuff like I like to learn or would like to learn. Uh, and then in the mid-afternoon, hang out with family and work out. And then at the evening, do recordings and anything that I need to do for these upcoming projects that I have going. Uh, so my schedule is pretty pretty loose at the moment, but I'm developing it to be a little bit more dynamic uh, because in in the past when I do this, uh, I get a lot of product, productivity out of it. When I don't do this, I don't get productivity. And so I'm trying to be productive again. Right now I'm not as productive as I wanted to be. At least I wasn't a few weeks ago. I've been way more productive recently. Cool, cool. Yeah. Um, you want to answer that? Yes. Uh, daily routines. I mean, what I try to maintain is um, there's something that I always go back to, and it's kind of like I, I kind of like kind of call it like the triforce of like figuring out like obstacles or challenges. But I try to kind of analyze my day uh, physically, emotionally, and mentally, and just see how I'm you know taking care of those different areas and aspects of my life. And, you know, obviously, you know, I want to make sure that I maintain my health, my physical health. I think a lot of artists suffer because they just focus in and just drawing and they think that that's the most productive thing. But even yeah. if you want to just keep it at a, like a selfish level of you being better as an artist, if you're not physically healthy, you won't be able to do art well. And you won't be able to do art for a long period of time, right? So it's you know, it's, your body is something that you have to maintain because it's something that you drive to perform, to create your art. Um, emotional is another thing, you know. Um, uh, this is something that I do just kind of like having time for myself to really think. I mean, people call it meditation or just whatever, but just having uh, that time of reflection is really important because if you have these emotional struggles that you're holding on to, um, that is also going to affect your work. And uh, also understanding why you're, you know, what your intent is and how that is going to affect your emotions. A lot of artists, man, I see right now, they are just trying to seek that validation. They're trying to like, we have, we have all these tools uh, from the internet that counts numbers, views, likes, and all these things. But what does that even really mean? We know how to count that engagement, but um, I don't think people really understand the value of that. So they just take it for what it is and, and or they, they look at it and they're just like, okay, this is my value. This is my worth. And uh, I, I, that, that creates a very unhealthy relationship with something that you should have a lot of fun and have passion with. So, yeah, I, I take the time for myself to really just reflect on what I'm doing emotionally and how, how I'm feeling. And then the last one is mentally. And I think that's more on to, onto like, the knowledge of what I want to obtain and also what I want to, how do I want to push myself as a person? And uh, maybe it's like, okay, I want to start getting better at painting deserts. Okay, what's the colors? What are the structures? What are the forms? How are, how is geography? How's the geography? Uh, what's the process of that? You know, the more that I understand that, the better I'm going to be able to execute on the, the task and goal that I have for myself. So again, going back to that Triforce, emotional, mental, uh, and physical, I feel like those are the things. It's, there, there's definitely more than that to maintain in life, obviously. But I felt those are like, kind of like the big priority points for me. And every day I try to figure out how do I maintain that so that my life is fulfilling and uh, um, healthy at the same time. No. Right. right on. Um, how okay. many more questions got we two got? More. Two more? Two more. Okay. This one's out. really quick. Yeah. Uh, Harsh says uh, Photoshop or Procreate, which is better? <laughs> oh, I, I like uh, Photoshop better. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, that's just for me. Yeah, Photoshop is is something that I enjoy more, but 
I see awesome work that's made in, in Procreate. So yeah. I think that's something you're just going to have to find out yourself. Yeah, I like Procreate. <coughs> Infinite Painter. I like Infinite Painter. <laughs> I like uh, Adobe Fresco. I like um, Clip Studio Paint. You know, I like all these softwares. But if I can only choose one, it would be Photoshop. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, if I if I was stranded on an island and I had yeah. to only pick one, only Photoshop because Photoshop, pick Photoshop is too. pretty yeah. powerful. Yeah, it's not made for us painters, so that's why I think a lot of people are very discouraged because they don't have a lot of really useful painting tools. But if you are a really understand the tool Photoshop has available, like the tools that it has available, it actually is an incredible photo creating tool, <laughs> you know. Or image creating tool, it can create really amazing images. Uh, so anyway, it's almost like a shop where you can make photos. <laughs> yeah, somehow it's like some sort of shop. Of it's kind of like build a bear, but for right, photo. Right. Next question. Um, <laughs> uh, John V says, uh, when assembling a portfolio for uni or a company, is it suitable to show studies, even if they are rough or not good? How does an artist voice perspective if they are uh, focusing on studies alone? Yeah, if, if you have nothing but studies, then that's not a portfolio. Maybe yeah. to get into a school, I could see that. But to get a job, mm. they're not going to be like, these are really cool paintings of fruits. Like that's not, uh, at least if you're working for like Fruit Ninja maybe, <laughs> you know. But even then they're like, you know, we want to see design fruits, you know. <laughs> We want to see fruits that are, have some aesthetic to them. Yeah. You got to think of it like this. It's like if you were to try to get a job at a aerospace engineering type position, right? Like working on designing spaceships and planes or whatever, right? And you're like, I'm re I have really good... Uh, like screwing in um, light bulbs. I'm really good at this, you know. I've done it a lot. I've read a lot of books on how planes work, you know. They're like, well, that's great, but where's your designs and where's your engineering, <laughs> you know. Like, it doesn't matter if you have extensive knowledge if you don't have application. And what that means for us as a in terms of a portfolio is – if you are practicing all these things, but then whenever you execute, it's not good, then that means whatever you're studying is not effectively helping you build a reasonable portfolio. I always tell people to have context with their studies. So that means that when you are studying without context, you may not, you may not uh, be actually designing a portfolio, portfolio building skills, because what might end up happening is when you start to build a portfolio, <clears throat> and everything's just so much more trouble, right? It's so hard. And so when you do a portfolio piece and you write down all the flaws and all the reasons why it sucks and the reasons why you struggled, and then you go study those specific things, that's more powerful. But then you reapply those studies into the next portfolio piece. You don't then show those studies of how you were, how you could potentially make a portfolio piece. You need to be able to walk in the door immediately, start working. And if you cannot do that, and you, you guys will know yourselves that if someone asked you to design a character design at a certain level, let's say you just go to ArtStation, pick that kind of art style, and you, the answer is no, then you don't have a portfolio ready to work for that studio yet. You know, you may not know the details of the, or the, the specifics of every single task you may have to do, but at least you can answer that simple question, right? If you wanted to work for Riot Games and you wanted to design a skin uh, for one of their champions, then can you demonstrate you already can do that? And if the answer is no, then you're not going to get a job like um, uh, most likely, right? So this is this is, to me is very simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to make it complicated, you know? Um, Realm, if you want to answer that, and then before we leave, I want to shout something out. Uh. Yeah, I mean, for the whole studies portion, I think that's like, yeah, knowing what your intent is. Um, sometimes I can see like value, for example, if you're trying to showcase that you're uh, picking like certain traits 
off of reality to make something like stylized. For example, like you, you have a, a good focus on like being able to translate uh, particular faces or maybe particular objects within the world and stylize it for, you know, maybe like Fortnite, right? And you're just like, hey, like I can make, I can translate assets from the real world. I think that's kind of cool, but obviously I wouldn't want to see a whole portfolio of that, like what AJ was saying. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge, uh, <laughs> I'm a huge proponent of like context. I think that's something that we need a little bit more of in this world. Uh, we shouldn't just be hands, you know, spoon fed information and just think that's the how the world works. So really understanding uh, the context of everything is, I think is just going to make you a better person and a better artist. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm trying to give you guys some solid info, man. Like, trust me, just focus less on filling out your portfolio um, with whatever, just fill it with portfolio pieces. If you feel a company would benefit from looking at your studies, then I guess that's fine. But in my experience, I've never been in a situation where the studies was like the the finding factor right deciding factor. yeah i'm like oh man like i'm not sure about this artist but the study of this portrait says everything Mm. you know never like if their study of their portrait is great but then the portrait of their characters is garbage or not consistently as good there's clearly a disconnect you know i mean it's it's a different skill to paint somebody really well than it is to design a face you know what i mean and so um uh, real quick, from the student's perspective, I think the the mistake here is that you want to demonstrate that when you don't know how to do something, that you'll try to learn it to the employer. That like, if I'm incompetent, incompetent at something along the way, I'll study and get it. And I, although that's the intention, it's just not worth it. Yeah, because the employer doesn't care. Yeah, think of it from the perspective of you are an employer and you're going to hire somebody, right? right? Would you hire somebody that you would have to train for several months to be as good as you need them to be? Or would you hire somebody that's already capable of doing the work? Right? Right. And mm-hmm. the answer is almost always going to be capable, right? It doesn't make sense to to hopefully pay for somebody's potential of being great, right? Versus somebody's uh, demonstration of being great. You know? That's what the portfolio is it's supposed to be y'all it's supposed to demonstrate your current skills right and if you're yep. currently not it's capable, expected that you can learn if you're not capable yeah it's expected and if you're not capable at something important on the job then we shouldn't have hired you yeah and, and we, we would hire you to be capable and trust me you don't want to be the kind of person too that just hires on that that feeling of like well maybe they'll get it along uh eventually you know i've been in that situation where we have hired people where we're like, we could probably figure it, they could probably figure it out. And it went poorly almost every single time. You know what I mean? In your AD role? Yeah. Like I've, oh. I've had to tell people like my, my, my boss is like, don't do that. Stop doing, stop hiring these people, you know? And, uh, they're like, oh, I don't know. Like, like I like the way this person's music sounds. It's like, yeah, but okay. Ask like, ask the simple question. Like, if the music that they have right now that they sent us, if we put it into the project right now as is, would you like that? <laughs> you know? Because uh, you like it because it's like, okay, like, give you kind of an abstract example. Like, it's like hip hoppy and it has like a really cool vibe to it, but we need more orchestrate music, right? But they like the sound of this. And then the person who submitted more of orchestraic music, maybe it just wasn't hitting on the right notes, right? But it fit the description, you know? And I asked yeah. that simple question is like, because you're counting on this guy's like sensibility to hip hop to somehow translate to orchestraic compositions. It's probably not going to happen, you know, because this guy just, we gave him the challenge and he, this is what he gave us and it's off the mark tonally, you know, it doesn't matter if it's just a cool song, you know, and, um, and then they, they they're, I don't know. And then we ended up, you know, going with something like this and it was like very challenging to deal with you know and then when we ultimately went with like the yeah we went with the person who just had this horn which was not as uh, much on the john or it wasn't much on the the musicality of it but the john was nailed it right like even if we didn't ch- art directed it or music directed it and just put it into the game as it, as is it was great already you know just wasn't like perfect 
And so directing that is easier because that person now we just had to like tell them about like give them examples and show them the types of tones and, and then ask for more variations. It's easier to deal with that person because that person lives in that wheelhouse. Like it would be weird for me to ask Ryoma to do like a really realistic creature design, right? As much as it would be really weird for me, someone to ask me to do a very stylized creature design, you know? Although we're both professionals and really skilled, it would be more of a challenge for us to do this something that's not in our wheelhouse, right? And we might not do well, even with our prestige. Does that make sense? And it's like, you don't want to count on that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And sometimes it can pull through. Sometimes those people are there and they can go, you know, I'll figure this out, dude. <laughs> and they do. But those are uh, outliers, in my opinion. I think this was a great answer to that question. Um, before we head out, I want to tell you guys that uh, we've had Rioma Tazzy here. He has a website. It's in the video description, um, as well as his art station. And he just recently launched his YouTube channel. Oh. So I will be sharing some links in the chat. I would love it if you guys went and checked out his stuff, gave him a subscription on YouTube as well as us. Um, and he also has a mentorship. So if you want to learn from somebody that does some style, hey, you know, to his work, take it easy. <laughs> give it a look. All right. There. I appreciate the comment. I got, I got to do the plugs. What are you trying to yeah. say about my stuff? Huh? You say I don't have style? Dude? How dare you? Uh, no, dude, you're it's just fine. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah and uh well, thank you guys for having me yeah, yeah absolutely and uh again i have launched a patreon seems like we're one person shy from 100 so whoever you are oh wow please let me know and um whoever that may be you can visit us at the patreon.com slash robot pencil and uh also in the description yeah and also have um uh, what you call it? I have a new tutorial out that's available if you just want to get a tutorial from me. It's drawing with confidence. Uh, and then I also am, what else am I also doing? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm also going to try to do another stream or so uh, more often. But right now we're putting out more video tutorials and video content. Um, and so plan for that to happen more consistently, more constantly. Please like comment and mention what you like about them, what you would like to see more of. That'd be great. And then so that way me and Mike can kind of build that content. And this is more on the free end. I don't think that all content that I should make should always have a price tag to it. Some content should just be available and for people to watch and listen to. So let us know. And if you don't already subscribe, please subscribe. And uh, with that, I'll see you guys later. Thanks again, Rilma. Appreciate yep. you. Thanks, man. All right. Thanks, guys. Everyone have a good one. <laughs> yeah, and cheers, everybody. Peace out, guys.